Greetings and welcome back to my channel. We are in a new sewing space. I had to move my sewing room down to the basement and I actually love it down here. The space is just phenomenal and I cannot wait to um, show it to you in the future. But today we are going to be going over medieval sewing techniques. It'll be easy, not all of them. Specifically, we're going to talk about facing, which is very simple and straightforward for the most part. But as a self-taught sewist, part of it was a bit of a journey. And I look forward to sharing that with you. Um, I, the lecture part before we get into the hands-on activity, Based on textiles and clothing by Elizabeth Crowfoot, etc., we know that on all of the existing examples from medieval clothing, whenever they would use a binding or a facing, rather than use a um, bit of bias or um, bits of the fabric that they used for their garments. They used a silk tabby woven ribbon always on the straight grain. And that was used to bind both straight edges and curved edges such as necklines and arm eyes. Now, obviously sewing down a straight edge is very simple. Very, very simple. But when it comes to a curve, sewing down Fabric on the straight grain, well, let's just say it's a little different from what this self-taught sewist was used to. So because I don't have a straight grain silk ribbon, I am using a straight grain linen tape that I cut from my dress earlier to make an alteration. And now I am pinning it to my dress facing, which is so I had a self taught sewist hiccup. I had a self taught sewist hiccup um, in my attempt to recreate neckline facing as it would have been done in the 14th century, I naturally did what I would usually do, which is to attach the facing to directly to the um, neckline, then fold it over and, well, prepare to stitch it down. I have it, I have it basted so that I can stitch it down. But after I sewed it, then understitched it so it wouldn't come up in the back. Um, that makes no sense to you, does it? So I understitched it to keep the facing from um, popping up um, while I'm wearing it and uh, to keep everything um, nice and neat from the front. Well, after I sewed it and understitched it and basted it, um, it was still sitting wonky. It was kind of sitting up, uh, like standing up a bit. And so I asked my friend Jerome, have you ever sewn a um, straight grain ribbon or um, piece onto a neckline? And she said that the way you do it is to actually attach the bottom part first and then fold down the top and attach it here at the curve. And while you're sewing, there will actually be a gentle gather, which will keep it from standing up, um, as she put it, like a very large mandarin collar. So now I get to unpick my seam and the understitching. <laughs> oh, to work we go. Let's figure out how to reattach it. 
first, I'm going to take a break and do facing I knew I can do. Well, sewing a facing on a neckline might be complicated, but sewing a facing on a straight line or a closure um, or even a hem could not be more simple. Simply take your fabric, sew right sides together, depending on how you're going to finish this. Uh, then press the seam open, then press it over. Um, on this step, it's a little up to your preference. I really like to understitch my um, facings um, so that they kind of stay put in the bottom. The inside part doesn't show as much um, from the outside of the garment. Um, but yeah, this part is up to your preference. Um, if I were entering this in a competition or trying to be extremely authentic, I would hand. Um, I would hand. I would do the understitching by hand, but since this is, I don't really have a lot of time really, um, and I'm only um, hand finishing the seams where it would show on the outside of the garment, I will be um, understitching this by machine. So iron it, press it, press it nice and down, then stitch it, fold the whole thing over, press it again so it stays in place. And, uh, and hem all of the edges. So, I, let's get to the sewing table with this. Hey, it's Editing Rosalie, conveniently dressed up like Presenting Rosalie, here to point out where I was inaccurate, at least for um, period examples. So, I'm working with linen, and I'm also working with, like, lined linen that is a bit heavy and I'm working with many layers and so um, I felt more comfortable naturally using a very thick um, piece of facing um, upon which to sew my eyelets. In period however the um, at least from the examples that we have the facings would be about half an inch and that's not even half an inch, like half an inch, which is much narrower. So rather than sew it and then press it and then sew it again, you would actually want to base down your edge on your working fabric and then um, sew over your facing. Or you could backstitch your facing at the very, very edge of your working fabric, then fold it over. But you're not going to have the um, you're not going to have quite the seam allowance on the inside that you would with my linen gown that I made. However, all of the extant examples are made of wool, and as we know, wool you know it fills up and it doesn't fray on you. So use what I'm telling you to do if you're working with linen. Um, at least what other Rosalie is telling you to do if you're working with linen. Use what editing Rosalie is telling you to do if you're working with wool. All right, back to whatever it is this crazy lady is doing. <laughs> so I have understitched as I did in the last thing that I filmed. Uh, pressed and then pressed the raw edge under and flat and basted it down so I wouldn't have to use pins. Now I'm going to finish the facing using a hand stitch, which you can see a lovely close-up of in my video, what was it? Uh, how to sew happy seams. But I won't be doing that again today, simply because my phone is on the fritz and I don't think it would appreciate me shoving it into my sewing box. At long last, I have cut a new straight grain ribbon from my linen, and because it's linen, I have folded down both sides and pressed them so that the raw edge won't be coming up. What is going on over here? Hi, please don't hit anything. <laughs> and what I'm going to be doing now, as opposed to the first time I'm doing it, what I will do now, as opposed to the first time I did it, is I'm going to 
actually sew down this part on the outside edge first and then sew down the neckline and I have um, been told that as you sew the neckline because it's um, the curve is much smaller at um, this point is that there will be um, some gathering and you can see it um, very slightly if you look very 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 closely at the examples in um, textiles and clothing. So first I'm going to baste it down and then I will be um, sewing it. And I've already basted down the edge of the garment itself. In order to attach the facing using wool and tabby woven silk, as seen in the extant examples, I would use the same method as shown with linen, whereby I baste on the raw edge of the neckline before attaching the outer edge of the facing first, followed by the upper edge and gathering as needed. Alright, now that that is done, I'm actually going to go through and stitch down the top properly, so I'll be doing all the gathering on it, and then I will just, um, and then I will go through and I will hem this down. <gasps> it's happening! I think, well, I think this one might actually work. Let's, let's see. Well, that took long enough, but the neckline no longer sticks up. So, we have, yes, it worked. Now I just have to go sew it down. I'm so happy. So I'm actually sewing when most seamstresses are doing their work. It is a quarter till midnight. And I have someone working my phone as a camera for a change. So I wanted to um, show how I am sewing the top part of the facing. I've been going to do the bottom part, just doing the hem stitch, but this part is a little bit <laughs> tricky. And so I try to come up here where the fabric is folded and then bring the needle in well below where the edges meet and then come up again at the fold. And I don't want to make the stitches too big because then it won't be secure. The smaller the stitches, the more secure your seam is always going to be. And the result is that no one can tell that you are doing an overstitch as opposed to sewing the wrong sides together using a running stitch or a back stitch and then folding over as one usually would. It takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of patience, <laughs> but it is well worth it. And now I must get my sewing assistant in bed. All is well that ends well. As you can see, the dress has turned out beautifully and I really couldn't be happier with it. I have actually found that having a straight grain instead of a bias or a facing that's cut on the curve has proven to give the garment uh, 
stabilization where it needs it. When you think about it, this curve, especially for 14th century gowns, which do have quite a deep one, um, that's a lot of bias. And so having that extra peace of mind um, has made a world of difference, especially in how the neckline lays. Um, if you go to my Instagram, I have loads of pictures and I think a couple reels of me twirling around in joy after all the many weeks and months I've spent working on this gown. Um, and as lovely as it is on the dress form, um, the neckline just doesn't, the sh shape of it doesn't quite do it justice. There's a very perfect um, scoop neckline that um, is what one is really looking for in uh, recreations of um, early 14th century clothing, which is obviously what I'm after. Uh, in the next video, we are going to be recreating some 14th century hairstyles, and I hope you will join me because that is something I find just so much fun. I love playing with hair. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for sitting through another one of my very low budget and admittedly poorly lit home videos and allowing me to share what I have gained with you. I really appreciate you spending your time with me. Until next time, Kindred Spirit. <laughs>